Hello, you are listening to The Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Now, our guest today is Bryant Lusk. Bryant Lusk is an author, and today we're going to talk about his book, Heart Disease and Hypertension, Vitamin Therapy for a Healthy Heart. And you can find out more about Bryant Lusk and his wonderful work at his website, bryantlusk.com. Welcome, Bryant Lusk. Hi, Kathy. I'm glad to be here. So, Bryant Lusk, you work in the aerospace engineer and industry, and yeah. you worked for many years for the United States Air Force. What prompted you to write a book about healing the heart? Oh, excellent question. But first, let me express my gratitude to you and your listeners for this opportunity to share this information. Um, well, my, my story may be on, uh, much like other people. I had a health condition. Uh, several years ago, and I went to uh, medical professionals, doctors, and so forth, and they ran several tests, but they couldn't determine what was causing my symptoms. So me being the proactive person that I've always been since childhood, I decided to uh, research myself. And during so, I came upon some very interesting information that actually did resolve my medical issues. And to my surprise, they also uh, subsided other issues that I was having all of my life, chronic issues such as asthma. And I, I was so excited about that that I decided I wanted to share this information with as many people as I possibly could. And the only avenue I could think of at the time was to write a book about it. So that is so admirable. I'm I'm so impressed. So would so what you're saying is the information that you're sharing in this book, Heart Disease and Hypertension, Vitamin Therapy for a Healthy Heart. It also healed your lifelong asthma? It, it didn't heal it, but it's greatly reduced the episodes. I would say 80% reduction in how often I use my inhaler or how often I have an episode, which, which was amazing to me because I've had, had asthma since the age of six or seven, if I recall. Ah, oh, I'm so sorry. And what were the heart issues that you had, if you wouldn't mind sharing with our audience, that you had that you resolved based on the therapies you discovered and write about in your book? Oh, absolutely. Well, back, I want to say uh, several years ago, 2014-ish, I woke up in the middle of the night in agony. I didn't know what it was or what was causing it. It was a foot cramp, actually. I never experienced a foot cramp in my life. And basically, the, my foot cramp the ball of my foot was trying to meet the heel of my foot. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it was locked in this, uh, in this position. And this went on for a few days where I started to sleep wearing uh, shoes in order to keep my foot straight to hopefully prevent the episode from occurring again. And wow. then I started having a, uh, I would call it a strange uh, heart palpitation, which caused more alarm. And that's when I decided to seek medical uh, attention. And when I went to the uh, doctor, they ran an EKG, which came out fine. They gave me blood tests and that came out fine. And they couldn't determine what was causing these uh, issues. And so as I did my research, and please consider, I, I've, I've been somewhat health conscious for most of my life. Uh, but I wasn't very health knowledgeable when it came to nutrition and, and nutrients and such. And it turns out it, what appeared to be happening is that I had a severe deficiency in, in basic minerals such as magnesium and potassium. And when I turned those deficiencies around, my foot cramps went away, that, that odd heart palpitation went away. And to my surprise, a few weeks later, my asthma began to subside. And, and at the time, I was actually taking a daily steroid inhaler. I believe it was called Flovent. And I was also using a rescue inhaler quite frequently. Uh, within a few weeks of starting to improve my magnesium and potassium deficiencies, 
I got off of the inhaler, I mean, the uh, steroid totally, which I had been on for several years. And my inhaler, which I was using probably, you know, twice, three or four times a week, went down to maybe once a month for very mild symptoms versus an actual asthmatic episode. That's an incredible story. Now, what I will say also, based on my many, my 29 years in natural healing, working, when I'm working with clients, anytime you have a cramp from the knee down, it's calcium, potassium, magnesium deficiency. And these cramps most often happen at night, like you talked about. But like you, I've had numerous clients over the years, even who have had, have had heart palpitations. And yes. if I put them on a good multi-mineral, it's highly absorbable, uh, uh, you know, and maybe some other heart nutrients, which we're going to talk about, such as CoQ10, mm -hmm. all their symptoms alleviate. And I'll, I'll, since we're talking about stories, actually, one of my best friends several years ago thought she was having a heart attack. So uh -huh. me, being her best friend, I went with her. And we were in the Emory University uh, emergency room all night. Like you, the doctors couldn't figure out anything wrong. She visited her cardiologist afterwards. Well, I put her on minerals because she was having these heart palpitations yes. as well as CoQ10 and all of her symptoms went away. And the cardiologists were not able to find anything physically wrong. <laughs> And that's just, a, that was amazing to me. And I'm so glad that you were there for your friend. And, and unfortunately, there's not enough people such as yourself per capita to help everyone to educate them and alleviate their symptoms. Which is why you wrote your book. Now, Bryant Lusk, what makes your book so unique uh, compared to others regarding heart disease and, and heart hypertension? Because lots of people have written about this subject. Absolutely. And, and that's a, a question I asked myself before putting a pen to paper. Uh, my process is, is the issue. How prevalent is the issue and how severe is the issue? And, and when I determined that it, it's prevalent and severe, the question I asked myself was, do I have the capacity, the mental capacity to write on such a complex, su complex subject? And if I feel that I do have the capacity, then I ask myself, well, can I bring anything new or unique to the discussion that hasn't already been put out in, in, in the mainstream? And that's where I think I hit the mark with this particular book in that I don't uh, express much about wholehearted diet changes, dietary changes, which is good, of course, that's an excellent approach. I don't speak much to exercise. I, I, I touch on it, but I don't spend a lot of time on it because most people are already aware of these things. What I've tried to do is link the, the foundation at the cellular level of health in order to improve uh, heart health and to mitigate uh, very common maladies such as hypertension as well. So I, I try to I'd say my book is more of a, you can plug it into any lifestyle, any dietary preference, and see reap benefits from it, uh, regardless of you're vegan, um, paleo, or keto, or, or what have you. You can stick to whatever you're doing, add this to your current lifestyle, and reap benefits from it. Okay, wonderful. And I agree with you. Unfortunately, my observation is that people treat diet like a religion, <laughs> yes. as opposed to science. Yes. And in my work as a medical intuitive healer, part of why what I do works is that every human being is biochemically unique. Yes. And I, I agree with you, you, you. Health starts at the cellular level. So if your cells aren't healthy, you're not healthy. Definitely. And there were certain, uh, during my research, terminology and, 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 and um, information that I felt should be mainstream, but for whatever, re whatever reason, it's not. Now I can understand maybe uh, back in the 19th century where many people weren't educated, some people didn't even know how to read or write in those days, where you wouldn't want to overwhelm the average person with you know, medical information. But in these days, we have a, a more educated society compared to you know, 150 years ago. 
where I believe that people can uh, understand and, court and uh, relate to certain information that's not beyond their capability to absorb. So in my writing, I try to bring very complex information to a more understandable palette, uh, for lack of a better term, yeah. and, and hopefully sort of translate that those scary terms into something people can, can relate to. It's very admirable. Now, Brian Lust, many doctors talk about the difference between plumbing problems in the heart and electrical problems in the heart. And a lot of times if you go to a cardiologist, they'll, you know, it's like this one's a plumber for the heart and this one's an electrician for the heart. Can you explain this for our audience? A absolutely. And just like many others, I used to utilize the term heart attack and cardiac arrest, you know, interchangeably, but that's inaccurate. It turns out that a heart attack is that sort of plumbing, pro plumbing problem, say that three times fast, that, that you just mentioned, to yeah. where one of our arteries are, are clogged or partially clogged, just mm -hmm. like a uh, pipe in the, uh, in the kitchen or the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And if that clog is not alleviated, the uh, muscle tissue or area that it feeds will slowly starve itself of oxygen and other nutrients to the point of injury or death of those cells. So, and that's the issue with the plumbing problem, uh, which is more common than uh, most people may be aware of. And then there's the electrical problem, which is the actual cardiac arrest, not a heart attack, but a cardiac arrest is the electrical issue to where those signals get crossed or, or chaotic and your heart beats irregularly or it stops beating wholeheartedly, which is called sudden cardiac arrest. Okay, great explanation. Now, Brian Lusk, what are the three categories of risk factors for heart disease? Oh, I, I, absolutely. You have the contributing uh, risk factors and you have the uh, risk factors that you can manage yourself and you have risk factors that you have no control over. Now, I won't get too technical, but the ones that you have no control over, of course, are things like your age, your um, uh, male or female uh, anatomy, uh, if you have a genetic disposition from uh, a history, a family history of heart disease, you, you really have little control over that to no control. The things that you do have some control over are what we just discussed a bit earlier, are like your diet, your, your lifestyle, your exercise you know, regimen, if you exercise at all. Um, and, and, and contributing factors, even though it's a lifestyle uh, factor as well, are things like smoking, mm -hmm. right? Uh, those who smoke uh, put themselves at a much higher risk of developing heart disease versus those who don't smoke. But that said, I understand how addictive uh, nicotine and cigarettes can be or, or whatever a person smokes. Fortunately, I've never had a uh, addiction to a chemical, but I have had family members that uh, have addictions. So I'm well aware that it's something that's it's not imaginative. You actually have a, a, a problem that needs to be addressed. And, and then there are those um, uh, things such as stress, anxiety, depression, uh, some of these things we can control a bit, some we can manage, uh, sometimes we can get out of those situations, and, and sometimes we need professional help. And someone in your profession may find that there's actually a, a nutritional component that's aggravating things such as anxiety and or depression as well. Absolutely. And here at the Natural Healing Show, we talk about what you can do, right? We have great yes. respect for doctors and People yes. such as yourself who've done a lot of research to share important information with the world. Now, Bryant Lusk, in your opinion, can diet alone prevent heart disease? And Alone, likely not, but it can mitigate the likelihood of developing heart disease. As with most things, it's a multi-pronged um, approach, and it depends on how much effort and or ability a person has to put into their heart health. Uh, economy plays a role. Uh, for instance, the types of food that we can afford to purchase, will, which is the diet aspect, will impact the likelihood of developing heart disease. 
Now, there are those exceptions where possibly for genetics or what have you, where some people live to 100 years of age while eating cheeseburgers and pizzas, you know, all of their lives. <laughs> but that's more of the exception than a rule. For sure. And with that, we're going to take a break and come back and listen more from Bryant Lusk, author of Heart Disease and Hypertension, Vitamin Therapy for a Healthy Heart. Hang in there and we'll be right back. So Brian Lusk, you just brought up a really important point, which is economy. So some people are not even able to afford healthy food, much less affording supplements. <laughs> so what are your feelings regarding food versus supplements? A excellent question. And I know through experience the impact of not having the, the financial means to purchase quality items. I grew up very poor on the south side of Chicago. Fortunately, my mother uh, did the best that she could with the meager resources that we had. For instance, she would actually cook um, uh, organ meat in order to help us uh, consume uh, things like zinc, iron, magnesium and such. So with, with the little finances that we had, she uh, used it to the best of her ability to uh, keep us as well fed and as nutritiously fed as possible. But of course you couldn't afford the things such as organic eggs or, or organic uh, juices or you know, organic produce and such. Uh, most of the things that are low cost are, are the least nutritious and, and they, they fill you up to take away that hunger pain, but they have a very low nutritional content and they have some unhealthy uh, additives to them as well. Unfortunately, uh, if, if I could wave a magic wand, I would find a way to incentivize the uh, produce industry, uh, farmers and such, where it's more financially advantageous to produce like more organic uh, uh, food for the public and where it's more affordable to the public. But unfortunately, I don't have that magic wand. Yeah, and you brought up a really important point. And there have been several times in my life, I remember. <clears throat> at one point in my mid thirties, my diet was, and this is me, I'm now 63. I, I would buy boxes of pre-baked muffins. I, I, I'm sorry, I need to interrupt you. You said you were how old? 63. <laughs> my, my diet is different, but I remember in my thirties, I went through a period where I'd have a muffin for breakfast, a muffin for lunch, and then yes. I would have macaroni and cheese for dinner. Yes. And, and so again, many of our audience who are listening, they might even think, well, wow, you were lucky. You got three meals a day. And that's it. That's right? absolutely correct. And I remember at the time I was like, wow, I'm hardly eating anything. I'm not losing weight. I, I look back now and I laugh and I was sick all the time. Right. Yeah. Yes. I was sick all the time because there was no nutrition in the food that I was eating. Absolutely. So, so Brian Lusk, you and I can both relate. So if someone finds themselves in the unfortunate circumstance of, you know, really scrounging, uh, and in this day and age with the pandemic and all the financial pressures, what is your advice for people who are wanting to make their heart better but they really don't have a lot of money to buy good food, much less supplements. Absolutely. And that's where we, we need to prioritize our resources, especially when we have very few resources to uh, utilize. So uh, for instance, rather than purchasing, um, trying, trying to get a good example, a, a cheeseburger, which is just, it's very common, right? Uh, and of course, in a grocery store, the the most affordable beef, if you are a meat eater, is the most fatty beef, uh, the, the, the less nutritious beef, but it's filling. It, it's a basically almost empty calories. So you, you can focus your resources, find low cost grocery stores and or coupons, 
in, in the more natural food that you can purchase, such as uh, green beans, spinach, uh, oranges, apples, that alone will help to improve your health, your immune function, and your heart health compared to those empty calories that we often crave just to make those hunger pains go away, uh, but before we can afford them. I would also encourage uh, people, uh, and it may sound uh, counter uh, intuitive because you have to pay for it when it comes to the economy, is to uh, find a quality multivitamin, which is basically a broad spectrum you know, nutrition pill. And, and this can fill some of the gaps that, that people suffer from by not being able to afford you, you know, the, uh, the best food options for themselves. And in, in my book, what I try to do is to identify uh, quality uh, supplements and a multivitamin that's also affordable. There are some very uh, high, um, qual high quality multivitamins out there but they cost uh, like $120 a month, you know, which is uh, cost prohibitive to many individuals. So yeah. there are some lower cost options out there. They're not on the exact same level as those top qualities, but you still will benefit from them. And the same, by the same token, I suggest uh, avoiding the extremely low cost multivitamins because they're more like a placebo. Right. So I'm gonna, since we're talking about cost-effective ways to be healthy. So if I had, so, and, and your book is so important because you're sharing knowledge and information. So at the time that I was eating, living on muffins and macaroni and cheese, I literally didn't know any better. <laughs> and, um, but one thing that I would do if I had no money, but I really wanted to, or little money, but I wanted to be healthier, I would make smoothies. Now, ah, absolutely. Now, exactly. And you agree with me. Now, health nuts will argue which is healthier, juices or smoothies. And the correct answer is smoothies because the pith and the fiber and the seeds of the fruits and vegetables are where the phytochemicals and Brian Lewis is giving a thumbs up for our audience who's listening. This is where the nutrients really are. So if you get a high quality blender, my favorite one is a blend tech blender. And again, people will argue which is healthier, a Vitamix or a, um, or, um, <clears throat> or a blend tech. I say blend tech. And I can remember years ago, I used to give talks and there was a gentleman named uh, Jack LaLanne, who's now deceased. He was a famous weightlifter who lived forever. And um, <clears throat> he had a Jack LaLanne juicer which is very low cost, okay? But again, if you, so big picture, if you can get a high speed blender and you can look up on the internet and here's a hint for our audience. There's a gentleman named Jeff Primack, P-R-I-M-A-C-K, Jeff Primack. And he's written many excellent books about food healing. One of his books, his smoothie recipes is available as a free download on the internet. And you can't print it out, you, you can't copy it, but you can Google Jeff Primack smoothie recipes. And he's got smoothie recipes for everything. But if you can find the farmer's market and start making smoothies, and the goal would be to do about up to 20 ounces of smoothies every day. And that's going to really, really help, okay? Um, I'm from the South. I love okra. And okra has a specific fiber that helps to heal heart disease and heart congestion, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so there are things that you can do. Um, so smoothies are, are really a, a big one. Any other suggestions about how we can be healthy on a budget for people with heart disease? Actually, I love that. And that's something that I do on a daily basis as well as, as a meal replacement. And I, I, to be honest, I didn't even consider the uh, cost savings. I just was after the nutritional content and delivery of, a, of smoothies. Uh, just, and that's incredible. Uh, and I really appreciate your sharing that with your audience. Um, well, it, partly is what you purchase, but the other part is what to avoid as well. 
Uh, I, I highly encourage people, something that I didn't do it in my youth, but I do on, on, a, on a regular basis. It's a reflex for me now. Read the nutritional content label on the things that you purchase. And you begin to get an idea of the, the uh, types of things that you're consuming, good and bad. And to make it easy for people, I would suggest they have a uh, actual milligram uh, column, but they also have a percentage of the daily recommended allowance column as well. And so if you just look at the percentage, that should be more readily available to understand how much of this substance that you're getting based on the recommended daily allowances. Um, and then begin to target, for instance, as you educate yourself on the uh, importance of, let's say, potassium, the question becomes, well, how do I obtain potassium? Can, can I eat a, a banana? Will, will that suffice for my daily uh, recommended allowance? And actually, it, it doesn't. But some options out there for potassium are bananas, avocado, uh, orange juice, milk, uh, believe it or not, if you read the uh, nutritional label content, it has uh, about, what, 300 milligrams of potassium in it. And we burn through our potassium on a regular basis, uh, just by uh, breathing, <laughs> by our heart beating, we're, we're burning uh, through, through potassium. It's something we really need to replenish, which is heart healthy. So I say that to say with, with the financial resources that a person has, as they become educated on, on what's healthy for them, they can begin to read these labels and, and spend their money on those items and avoid spending money on the other items that have very, uh, almost zero nutritional value for them. Now, Brian Lusk, in your wonderful book, Heart Disease and Hypertension, Vitamin Therapy for a Healthy Heart, you talk about minerals. And we, talk, we started talking about minerals at the beginning. Absolutely. Again, a very inexpensive way to add minerals into your art heart is by getting the right kind of salt in your diet now most of us if you go into the kitchen you're like well i already have salt i've been eating salt my whole life well what you want to get and this is my professional opinion there's two kinds of salt that you want to consider uh, one of them is celtic sea salt now celtic sea salt is high in minerals and again, this is very cost effective because you're gonna to need to get salt. And Celtic sea salt is high in minerals. It will help your body um, absorb the minerals that you need to, to prevent the foot and leg cramps that Brian Lusk was talking about. And if you put a little bit of Celtic sea salt in your water, it actually helps your body absorb the water better. And in addition to Celtic sea salt, you can get pink Himalayan salt. And the pink salt will not raise your blood pressure. And many people are, here we're talking about heart healing high, high blood pressure, hypertension. Well, the pink salt will not adversely affect your blood pressure. That, that is wonderful. Uh, and as I'm here taking notes as you speak as well, I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> Um, and, and that's another way of uh, focusing your resources on the things that help versus the things that hurt. Uh, absolutely wonderful information. And uh, when it comes to supplementation, uh, some people just use the term magnesium, which is common, but quite often what's overlooked is, as you just alluded to, well, there are different types of magnesiums out there. Some absorb extremely well and some barely absorb at all. And unfortunately, the most common form of magnesium that you're going to find in multivitamins or in the grocery store is the one with the lowest absorption rate, which is magnesium oxide. Reason being is extremely uh, cheap to produce. So of course you can reap a lot of profits off of magnesium oxide. Uh, based on studies, the typical person absorbs approximately 4%, only 4% of the doses of magnesium oxide when taken. And the rest, of course, goes by the way of the toilet. It's, it doesn't hurt you, but it doesn't really help you. And so you're spending a lot of money with very uh, little benefit from it. So I suggest things such as magnesium citrate, which is highly absorbable. And then there's magnesium glycinate, 
And even more recently, they've come up with magnesium biglycinate. So basically they uh, marry a magnesium molecule to a glycine molecule, which makes your body absorb it even better. It have very high absorption rate and it will last a long time, longer time in your system because of those absorption rates. And uh, another way to absorb magnesium is by taking Epsom salt baths. Yes. So here we are, we're talking about positive, way, effective ways of healing our heart naturally. So you can go to any drugstore or grocery store and buy Epsom salts. And yes. you want to put in the average bathtub, just put a cup of Epsom salts and sit in it for at least 20 minutes because your skin, people forget, your skin is your largest organ and you can absorb magnesium through your skin. So if you are listening and you're like, wow, I have leg cramps just like Brian Lust did. And I'm having heart palpitations just like Catherine's friend did. Well, a simple way to start to get better is by taking Epsom salt baths on a regular basis, maybe every night before you go to bed to alleviate those muscle cramps. Now, Absolutely. Now with that, let's take another break to listen to a message from one of our commercial sponsors. And we're going to be right back to listen to Bryant Lusk, author of Heart Disease and Hypertension. So Brian Lusk, you were talking about the kinds of magnesium that are most easily absorbed by the body. How important is magnesium for the heart and what does magnesium do for the, our heart to make our heart healthier? Oh, uh, Catherine, we could write an entire book on the processes that magnesium are necessary for to be healthy in, in a healthy heart. It, it's responsible for over 300 cellular processes in the human body. Uh, without magnesium, we would drop dead on the spot. It's also part of our bone skeletal structure as well. Uh, most people are familiar with calcium when it comes to bone health, but your bones also contain and need magnesium as well. And when it comes to your heart, your magnesium is one of the body's natural muscle relaxants. And of course, for your heart to operate, it needs to constrict and relax. And that's that pumping effect. Uh, that, that we, we feel when we listen to our heartbeats. Well, if we're, if, we're, if, we're, if we're low in certain minerals, such as magnesium, calcium, zinc, potassium, then that we talked about that, that electrical right, signal for the electrical problem that we can have, that, that will cause or aggravate those electrical problems and can lead to cardiac arrest. So magnesium, your muscles are, require magnesium as well as calcium in order to function properly. Now you were, one of your other books is called Osteoporosis and Osteopenia, Vitamin Therapy for Stronger Bones. So, so magnesium, as you said, while we're taking magnesium for our heart, it also helps our bones. And here at the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio, we interview, interview world experts such as Bryant Lusk about natural healing. And recently I interviewed a medical doctor who is an expert on healing trauma. And she said she does not treat any person until she first puts magnesium, um, topical magnesium on their skin. So if you're listening and you're like, wow, okay, I've got anxiety, I've got heart disease, I've got muscle cramps, then more than likely your electrolytes are deficient. So what you're seeing, Bryant Lusk, is by taking these um, electrolytes, these minerals like calcium, magnesium, potassium, and zinc, these minerals can help some of the electrical problems that we may have in our heart. Definitely. And, and that's just one of the multitude of things that it, it interacts with in our bodies. For instance, zinc is extremely important for our immune uh, function, as well as vitamin D. And a lot of people may not be aware that vitamin D that we ingest, which is uh, uh, from the sun, we convert it to D3 versus D2. That is not the actual vitamin D that's measured in your bloodstream when they take those measurements. 
there's actually a conversion from what you ingest or absorb from the sun that occurs in the liver. And in order for that conversion to work properly, you need magnesium, or well, your liver needs magnesium for that conversion process. And when it converts to that second form of vitamin D, that's what they're testing for, typically when they draw your blood. So to, to improve or maintain healthy levels of measured vitamin D, it's important to have uh, adequate levels of magnesium and a healthy liver, along with, of course, a vitamin D uh, consumption or absorption from the sun's rays. But what, what I found even more interesting is that there is a third conversion process beyond the measured levels where the vitamin D goes into your kidneys. And within your kidneys, that's where the final decision point occurs to create the hormone, calcitricol, if I'm saying that correctly, or if you have enough to go ahead and let it go into the uh, toilet. Now, from your research that you write about in your book, Heart Disease and Hypertension, what are the most important nutritional supplements for our heart? Well, definitely magnesium, uh, first and foremost, I, I would say. Um, definitely uh, zinc, because uh, zinc actually regulates the, uh, how much calcium flows in and out of your muscle cells to, uh, to contract or to, to let, allow them to relax. And uh, we, we don't store zinc that well. That's something that we should try to get on, a, if not daily, you know, every other day or every three day basis at, at, at a minimum. Um, uh, potassium, of course, we discussed, but then we, we, we have to talk about another part of, of heart health, which is actually our arteries themselves. Because quite often that plumbing problem, which is the most, one of the most prevalent causes of heart disease, it, it, it occurs through plugged arteries that feed our heart. And that can also lead to uh, stroke as well. And it turns out that there's this inner lining inside your artery because your artery is not just a hollow tube like a water hose that's just, just a conduit for fluid to flow through. Your arteries are actually have processes that regulate our temperature. They uh, help with our immune response. It, our arteries do much more than just allow blood to flow, flow back and forth. Well, the inner lining of our arteries is this, uh, it's a uh, skin basically called endothelium. And, and it is that very lining that is extremely important to heart health because when you have a healthy endothelium, it produces this uh, substance called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide actually prevents or diminishes cholesterol's ability to stick together and the cholesterol's ability to stick to your arterial walls, or the inner walls. So when you have a healthy endothelium, you actually are extremely lowering your risk of developing those plumbing problems that we discussed. And so and substances that are, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, yes. I was gonna say substances that are good for the endothelium, with magnesium being one of them, are uh, uh, there's a chemical that plants produce naturally to defend themselves. Uh, and and that, that particular chemical is very prevalent in red grapes. And that's why they say red wine is healthy for the heart. Of course, not in a, you know, excess. <laughs> Well, 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 when you consume red grapes, your body actually has more of this chemical for the arteries and also for the endothelium to remain healthy, to produce uh, those nitric oxide. Well, go ahead. So you're, you're referring to resveratrol? Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to take a crack at... Um, <laughs> it. I know. <laughs> and, and they also have some uh, antioxidant uh, effects as well, which, which is good for the arteries. And uh, then there's also in green tea, uh, catechins. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> I, I couldn't say it any better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is extremely helpful for, for our arteries health. And, and the beauty of these substances is you don't need a lot. You don't have to overdose on these things to reap the benefits. Uh, based on studies, very low amounts actually yielded fantastic benefits for these subjects in those studies. Now, what about pomegranates? In your book, you talk about pomegranates. Can you explain for our audience how do how pomegranates help our heart? A absolutely. One is a, uh, it, 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 
it's a catalyst for a, a enzyme that actually helps to lower our blood pressure. It has an antioxidant effects as well within our blood system and it improves circulation. And uh, the beauty of pomegranates, uh, such as pomegranate juice or actual pomegranates, is, is again, you, you don't need to uh, consume you know, three gallons of pomegranate juice to reap the benefits. They, they recommend three to five ounces is all a person needs. And the beauty of this as well is there is some crossover effect between res, uh, resveratrol. Thank you. They are really fast. <laughs> <laughs> and the impacts of pomegranate juice and the impact of green tea. And I say that to say, if a person gets bored with one or the other, you can you know alternate. You can take them all at the same day. You can do whatever that that you feel is natural to add this to your um, your daily routine. So this is wonderful. And these are things that we can do that are low cost, drinking a little bit of pomegranate juice every day, taking yes. Epsom salt bath every day, use, yes. switching out your table salt. Can you explain for our audience why regular table salt is actually not good for the heart? Well, one is, uh, I'll, I'll use the term concentrated. Uh, 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 two, it, it, it's not directly from the earth, like the Himalayan salt has those added salts to it that this does not, those added benefits. So uh, I, I would say, I, I guess the best way to put it, uh, like a car, you can use regular gas, unleaded or super unleaded, right? Uh, and the unleaded causes buildup inside, like carbon buildup inside the, uh, the engine itself over time, whereas a super unleaded burns cleaner. So the basically the, the basic salt does not work as cleanly or yield the same amount of benefits as the uh, salts that you've mentioned. Right. Now, um, how can water cause more problems sometimes than it results yes. when we're talking about our heart? A absolutely. And, and, and this is gonna sound very counterintuitive, uh, but I, I understand the, uh, the, the, the desire is a positive desire when you tell people you need to hydrate, right? Uh, of course, we need to hydrate to avoid uh, uh, you know, fainting spells or suffering from dehydration, which is very bad for us. But when we say hydrate, quite often the only substance that we talk about or that is thought of when you hear the word hydrate is water. But the reality is in, in, in a hot Georgia or Florida sun, you're out there sweating, perspiring, exerting yourself. You're not just losing water. You're, you're losing a host of nutrients, especially those minerals that we discussed. So the, the, the problem that could uh, result from hydrating with water, overhydrating, is you've already depleted your mineral stores in your body, and now you're drinking water, water, water. You're actually flushing out those, those very minerals that you already depleted through uh, perspiration and, and exertion. So I'm not saying water in and of itself is bad for you. I am suggesting that when you hydrate, you try to hydrate with something that has some mineral or electrolytes in it, uh, such as coconut water may be an option to consider or some of the salts that Catherine uh, just mentioned. Yes, and I agree with you completely that you take if you take somebody and they're already having muscle cramps. And again, if you're listening to this and you're, you realize that you're having heart palpitations and or muscle cramps, you are definitely mineral deficient. And so you're going to want to even just a pinch of Celtic sea salt because a lot of people like, I don't like this. Interestingly, last night I ate at an Indian restaurant and they had this delicious lemonade. And the waiter told me we make it every day. And he said, it's a little salty. Well, they put fresh lemons in it and they put salt in it. And it was like, this is so smart because it's going to help you hydrate. So get some Celtic sea salt and or Himalayan salt and put it in your water and you can absorb it better. So yes. Brian Lusk, how does the health of our liver affect our heart? Oh, excellent question. It it turns out the liver plays such an incredible role in our general health, including our heart health. 
it, it, it filters out uh, things that we don't want. It stores a lot of the fat soluble vitamins such as vitamin D. A person can go into a cave and not have consume vitamin D for up to, I believe it's 45 days. And if their liver is healthy, it would have stored enough vitamin D3 and release it slowly where their body wouldn't even know the difference. But unfortunately, not purposely, most of the time, we mistreat our livers. Uh, for instance, when I was a, uh, a frozen food addict, basically, right? <laughs> there, were, there were a lot of preservatives and other chemicals in there that are, are harmful to the liver when you over inundate the liver day after day after day. And also things uh, such as, uh, you know, fatty foods, uh, the, the cheeseburgers and so forth. You can develop a condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which uh, the liver makes the liver not perform to its to its uh, best ability. And by doing so, it can no longer create uh, substances such as bile, which actually helps to control our cholesterol levels as well. So uh, yeah, the liver is is a primary plays a primary role in our heart health and in our overall health, overall health as well. So Brian, last final question, because we're talking about cost-effective ways to heal our heart naturally. And you brought up a really important question earlier, which is what not to do. Here we're talking about all these things to do. You mentioned don't smoke. What else sh should we avoid doing when we're wanting to heal our heart naturally for not very much money? Absolutely. Not smoking, especially with the cost of cigarettes these days alone, would save a person a ton of money. And again, it's an addiction, so I don't want to minimize the impact or the difficulty it is to give up smoking. But but if you can, definitely do so. And if you've never started, don't start ever in your life. Uh, of course, drinking alcohol in, in, in excess can damage our liver which then can cause a lot of our processes to not be at their peak, including our bone health, because our liver is, converts that vitamin D3 into that second form that's measured in, in our bloodstream. Uh, of course, uh, stress, um, we, as a society, I would say, and, and I'm guilty as well, I like nice things, right? We, we all like nice things, nice clothes, you know, nice home, you know, nice transportation, if, if we can afford them but we stress ourselves at work in order to achieve or obtain these nice things, the bigger house, you know, and so forth. Now, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be ambitious in life, but we need to be balanced in our approach because your, the stress that you are heaping upon yourself, myself included in the past, can and will take years off of your life in, in the future if you're not careful. And so stress, uh, anxiety, bad relationships, and that's where uh, other people can impact your heart health and, and your overall health, in your mental health. Uh, uh, try to disassociate with, with uh, bad relations. And, and again, sometimes that's not easy. You know, sometimes you're sharing the same roof, under the same roof with that person, and you can't just pack up and, and buy a new home. Mm -hmm. I, I totally get that. But where you can, be it your, your circle of uh, acquaintances or in a work environment, uh, try to, to, to minimize uh, interacting with people that will either drag you down or cause you to be depressed or anxious or, or try to hype you into, hey, if you stress yourself out for this, uh, six months from now, you, you might be able to achieve that. So, so balance is very important as well. You've been listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Our guest today has been Bryant Lusk, author of Heart Disease and Hypertension, Vitamin Therapy for a Healthy Heart. You can find out more about Bryant Lusk and his wonderful work at his website, bryantlusk.com. And remember, when you take care of your heart naturally, everything in your entire body gets better because in Chinese medicine, the heart is the emperor of the body. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.